right, so let's go back to 1968 if we can now. But first, let me set the stage. Richard Nixon elected the president. Johnny Cash records his legendary, I'm Johnny Cash, live at Folsom Prison. Martin Luther King Jr. is assassinated, and Pierre Trudeau becomes Canada's 15th prime minister. And all the while that was happening in a little neighborhood outside of Toronto called Willowdale, a young kid named Alex Lifeson formed a band called Rush. You got a singer bassist named Getty Lee. Now they had an original drummer, but a few years later they made a change. Neil Peart joins in, and together the three would make Canadian music history. Now, Rush's debut album was a massive success. In fact, the highest selling debut by a Canadian band. In fact, their career has been so huge, I'll put it to you this way. The top four bands with the most gold or platinum albums in a row. Who do you think are in the top four? Well, one, obviously the Beatles, the Stones, Aerosmith, and Rush. That's some pretty impressive company. Overall, Rush has released 18 albums, sold more than 40 million copies, played sold out shows all around the planet. Rush are what you call Canadian rock royalty. They've been inducted into the Juno Hall of Fame. They've got a star on Canada's Walk of Fame. They've been made officers of the Order of Canada, which means they can arrest you. That's not true. These days, the guys have just got a brand new DVD. It's called Snakes and Arrows Live. Alex and Getty, it's Rush. It's the mustache. It is. <laughs> Dude, Neil's mustache in that, uh, in that copy of 2112 is fantastic. That's a serious mustache. It's a serious mustache. It's still alive. It's walking around somewhere. <laughs> you got a brand new DVD out. I, I, and I know you probably get this question a lot, but I, I'm just, just curious about when you, when you first got it going. You were a kid when you started the band. Did you, I mean, you're decades and decades later, and it's, you know, it's, it's you and you, and, it's, and, now, and then Neil joined the band when you were still young, and, it's, and you're still making music and still selling records and still getting standing ovations. Was that the kind, was it, did you have a plan when you started this? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty surreal. Is it? Uh, you know, you, of course, when you're a kid, you dream of being successful, but you don't really have any idea what that means. Mm -hmm. So you think successful is getting a gig, and then that grows into making a record, and that grows into getting a tour, and then before you know it, you're touring, and then the idea of, you know, 40 years later to still have that opportunity is, is quite surreal. What's interesting too about you guys is it always seemed like when you were younger too, you were playing music that was 10 or 15 years older than you. So when I watch, if you go watch, you know Gene Simmons is on the show tomorrow, and, I, and I, Kiss is a great band, people like Kiss, but when you see Kiss at this stage of their life playing Strutter or Deuce, mm -hmm. you go, ah, oh, they're singing about a glory day. But when, when you guys go on stage and play some of your songs, it doesn't, like, it seems like you've grown into your own songs. That as adults, it doesn't seem silly to play those records. Well, sometimes in a rehearsal, it's, it feels silly. <laughs> uh, yeah, every once in a while when we, uh, we pull a song out that we haven't played in a long time. I, I remember we went through this with 2112 when uh, we kind of took it out of the show for a while and then we kind of uh, decided, okay, let's, let's bring it back. And then during rehearsal, it just it felt so uncomfortable. But as we started playing it, it's like we rediscovered the song, and then you play those songs with more passion and more kind of renewed vigor, and, and they grow on you all over again. And for you, when you sit back and, like, when you plan a set list, is it the three of you kicking around a bunch of songs? And the Stones, Mick calls the shots, and even Keith would like to know what Mick has in mind tonight. So for, for you guys, how do, how do you, when you have that many songs, how do you put together a set list? Well, we give Mick Jagger a call and see <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very tough. I mean, we have a lot of songs, and you know, they're the ones that you need to play uh, with every tour, and they're the ones that you want to play, and uh, you try to find a balance. Usually, we come up with about uh, five hours of music and sort of whittle it back to that three hour time frame. Three hours is a long set. Yes, it yes, is. It is. Do you, um, do you ever felt like, have you ever felt like you're insiders? You know, I mean, to be really successful, but your band always, your personalities, the way you guys seem to have approached being really successful is that you 
Looked like you always felt like you were outsiders. Yeah, I think that's accurate, yeah. yeah. We still feel like outsiders, I think. Yeah. yeah. I don't know just why. Just call just... it up. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder at what stage of your, your career you went where you thought, okay, I don't think we have to worry anymore. I think we're okay. I don't mean I'll well, be motivated. It's, yeah, it's, not about, it's not about worry. It, it, it's just about where you fit in, in the grand scheme of things. And uh, fortunately for us, we've never bothered to think about that for too long. You know, we've always kind of gotten busy with the matter at hand, whether it's an album or whether it's a tour or whether it's just, you know, staying sane from being on the road too long. Or, so those things, it's like putting one foot in front of the other and then you just, once in a while, you pull back and you go, wow, that that's a career all of a sudden. How did it get to be so many years long? Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's, it's, it's an amazing career that we've had, and we're very fortunate to have had it. I suspect maybe part of that, the personality trait of your band is what's allowed the three of you to kind of still do this through high highs and low lows. Is if you were too much insiders, it would have probably destroyed you. Yeah, well, I guess. I don't yeah. even know what an insider is, really. <laughs> How do you get in? Yeah, well, no. Nobody sent us the membership uh, form. You didn't get that one. Uh, and uh, I guess another thing that people talk about in the context of Russia is you stayed in Canada. Yeah. You were able to achieve the success everywhere, but you stayed in Canada. Yeah. Conscious decision? Absolutely. Yeah, it's yeah. home. We all have families here. We raised kids here. It's a great place to raise children. Geez, we're Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> I heard stories that when you play in South America, you get mistaken for pe other people. <laughs> I get mistaken for other people uh, in airports. In airports? Yeah. Who do they I think get, you are? They think I'm Bono sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Bono. <laughs> uh, and uh, for some reason, uh, people with Spanish accents think I'm Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> They're right. You're right. that guy from the Osbournes. Yeah. Uh, okay, sure. Even better, you're that guy from the Osbournes, not you're that guy from Black Sabbath. Right. That's, the even, that's, that's how being a rock star has changed over the years, hasn't yeah. it? Yeah. How about the moment you met Ali, Jimmy Page? Uh, actually, we went down to see um, Page Plant play, and it was in the summer of 1998. And, and Getty has an interesting story about how he met Robert Plant, and it all started from that. But okay, so how'd you meet Robert Plant then? Okay, well, <laughs> I was on a bicycle trip with my wife in Morocco, and we ended up, uh, it was a group of us, and we ended up at this uh, beautiful hotel in the Atlas Mountains, and I was given the room key. My wife and I were trotting along we went and we were in this room that had just two rooms one on the right one on the left and I was checking in turning the key to open my door and I heard the other door across from me opening and I turned around and it was a guy that looked just like Robert Plant coming out of there and he looked at me I looked at him <laughs> and we both kind of went that's weird <laughs> and we went and he went his way I went my way and I said that guy looks so much like Robert Plant. And so then I went to, uh, we were in the dining room having dinner and he, he came up to me and he said, what are you doing here? And of course it was him and we, we chatted and he'd been coming to this hotel for years. And, uh, well, didn't the, Zeppelin in the early days of Rush, Zeppelin said that, or as a page said that, Rush was one of the bands he was excited about, right? Yeah. I think, yeah, they would mentioned that in an interview somewhere. Yeah. And so then, so through that, you, you got to see... Robert. Yeah, well, we, you know, we kind of exchanged numbers and s stayed in touch. And when he came to Toronto to play, you know, he called me up. And uh, so the two of us went down to, to watch them. They and then great. we went backstage, and, and uh, it was at the Molson's Amphitheater. So, you know, we know the, the dressing room's back there. And uh, Robert had his room, Jimmy had his room, and we were sitting with Robert and just talking about stuff. Yeah. And, uh, and Jimmy came in, and I was like... <laughs> I was like mental, <laughs> nervous, and I was so excited. I mean, he was my absolute hero growing up as a guitarist. I, I wanted so much to play like him and think like he thinks when he plays. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was really, really exciting. Yeah, they were totally charming guys. They were guys. great. They were super we hung nice. in their dressing room until basically minutes. We walked actually downstairs with them to the stage when they went on stage. And, uh, and I know our dressing room is a no-go area yeah. for about... Uh, two weeks before we actually go on. <laughs> yeah. It was very quiet. And do you guys have separate control. dressing rooms or do you guys have the same dressing room? We have the same dressing room. Neil has a separate dressing room because he keeps his drums in there. No one wants to be close to drums. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, he's got a whole different schedule because he arrives, you know, 
on motorcycle and then he's at the gig early and then he's cleaning his motorcycle and then he's then he's got to have his nap time because he's, he's been older up. than us <laughs> <laughs> he's been up since like you know five in the morning riding his motorcycle so uh it's best to leave the dramas separate well, you guys do you guys still live a couple of blocks away from each other yeah yep. right now you know that there are so many bands out there who can't comprehend that that you've been together as long as you have uh, working together but even when you're not working together. Like most bands can't even live in the same city for crying out loud. No, I mean, he just won't go away. I, <laughs> well, I gotta take my rent checks to him. And yeah, fair so. enough. <laughs> Getty's got the house, is that what it is? <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, in the basement. <laughs> uh, the, uh, by the way, we'll talk about the, the funny parts of your blue face on the DVD in a second, but we're doing one million acts of green. We have mm -hmm. a, you know, near 400,000 acts of green right now on our way to one million. You guys got an act of green? Well, we're a big recycling family, composting family, so I guess that would be our most significant act of green. Yeah, yeah we're, we're almost weird about uh, recycling. Um, we're also building a house just north of the city and um, gonna have a wind generator there uh, to generate some electricity as well as uh, a, um, a geothermal system for keep cooling and heating. That's at least a few acts of green right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, I mean, it's just the way to think. That's, we, we need to think that way. Even just going grocery shopping, taking your own bags, mm -hmm. it's really cool. It's fun to do that now. And they don't rip. <laughs> <laughs> and the bags are so great. Yeah, yeah they, they don't, don't rip. You want to do my grocery shopping for me? Sure. <laughs> Give me a list. <laughs> this is DVD. It's called Snakes and Arrows Live. Uh, here's the thing. Here's the thing. When you, when you put on the menu, there's this blue face, or my TV green face, spinning around, and it's you. It's your face, and then Neil's on, uh, on it as well, yeah. and lots of outtakes. Did you just say, you know what, I want to be the guy in the makeup today? <laughs> well, we love doing that kind of stuff. Uh, it just, we feel connected to it, and we have so much fun doing it. Um, and there's some great outtakes from, from some of that you know, more humorous stuff that, that we do. Yeah, we have a lot of fun putting yeah. our intro films together, and, and you know, it's a three hour show, so we like to inject some silliness in there when we can. I think it's nice to watch our audience have a smile on their face sometimes. Well, you see, they're not, uh, they're not laughing, chuckling during trees? Is that what you're saying? Not... <laughs> have you Some played, are, have yeah. you played your song in a rock band too yet? Have you tried that, the drum parts? Yeah, we did. We tried it. <laughs> Actually, the only time that we tried it was when we were doing the Colbert Show. Uh, the guys that <laughs> run their, their website took us upstairs into their offices, and uh, they wanted to see us attempt to play Tom Sawyer in it. It was a miserable failure. Ten seconds, we crashed. You Ten crashed? seconds, the game shut I down. I didn't crash. I well, you hadn't part. actually started yet. I so it was the drummer mostly. Is that what you yeah, did? Yeah, it was the drummer. Yeah, the drummer's. Oh. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Alex and Getty Rush, everybody. Woo!